This is Ruth Guthrie. This module is about the history of the Internet and how it works. Though origins of the Internet go back farther than 1968, we'll start at that year. The Internet and other tech innovations got their start in military applications. ARPANET was a military wide area network, WAN, where the technologies and ideas that grew into the Internet were born. In 1971, the same year as the movie Clockwork Orange was released, file transfer protocol and email were invented. It is hard to imagine that email never existed. People used to write letters and memos, and no one worked on the weekends answering business email. You would actually go on a vacation and not check in with your job through your email. You were free. File transfer protocol gave people a way to connect to remote machines and share files. In 1973, Vinton Cerf from UCLA created TCP IP, the transmission protocol used for the Internet today. Vinton Cerf is one of the fathers of the Internet. In fact, surfing the web was supposedly named after him, C-E-R-F-I-N-G, the web, not, hey dude, surfing the web. In 1977, modems for personal computers became available so that instead of standalone hardware, People, mostly hobbyists, could dial up and connect to other computers. In 1984, the DNS, Domain Name System, we'll talk about this later in this lecture, was developed. This made routing and addressing a bit more user-friendly. In 1989, America Online was started. You couldn't walk into a store anywhere without seeing free CDs that offered 400 hours of America Online for free. These things were everywhere. It seemed impossible that AOL would grow so quickly, but in 2000, AOL was big enough to buy Time Warner for $160 billion, a number that boggles the mind, but we see these crazy mergers and buyouts still today. In 1991, the first web pages were developed by Tim Berners-Lee, also a father of the Internet, who was trying to finish his dissertation and get his committee members to talk to each other. Using hypertext, he accomplished this and developed hypertext transfer protocol, the HTTP that you see today at the beginning of each web address. Finally, in 1993, 20 years ago now, the first graphic web browser, Mosaic, was developed. Now, instead of having to remember a lot to surf the web, you could easily navigate through it. This very old-school screen capture is an example of how the web once was navigated. Every host had a menu you could pick from to navigate down into their content. In this example, if I wanted to access my email, I would type E, the letter E, to get there. To search for information, I would type G for Gopher, the search engine at the time. This menu would lead me to lower-level submenus. You get the idea. It was slow and maybe a little mysterious, too. This is a screenshot of the first graphic web browser, Mosaic. Moving along, in 1995, two companies that you know fairly well were founded, eBay, known as Echo Bay at the time, and Amazon. Interestingly, it took Amazon six years to make a profit. Some of you may have Hotmail accounts still. Hotmail was started in 1996. Google was started in 1998. At the time, many online businesses were starting, and a lot of them didn't have a clear path to profitability. In the year 2000, the dot-com bubble burst, sometimes called dot-bomb, meaning that the online companies had massive stock drops or went out of business entirely. An example, Cisco's stock declined by 86%. Amazon's stock went from $107 a share to $7 a share. Wikipedia began in 2001. In 2003, MySpace was started, becoming the most popular social network in the world until Facebook overtook it. Later, internet giants like YouTube and Twitter were founded. This chart from Forrester Research shows the growth and projected growth of online retail sales in the United States. By 2015, it is expected to exceed $280 billion. The move to online business and online modes of doing things 
has been a massive change over a relatively short period of time. This is a very simple diagram to show you how the internet works. From your computer, you request a website or some action simply by typing in the address or URL, Uniform Resource Locator. Once you press enter, your message is sent to a domain name server, DNS. The DNS looks up the IP address, IP stands for Internet Protocol. Then the name server routes your message to the appropriate host. The host answers your request by sending you the web page that you requested. Simple, right? It's only a little bit more complex than that. Here's our picture again, but this time there's an internet map from Wikipedia 2007 intended to show the links between the servers and computers connected to the internet. It looks like some kind of nebula or something. When you make your request from your computer, it doesn't actually go directly to the web server. It needs to be routed over many computers to get to where you send it. Think about it. If you ask for a website in Namibia, say www.gov.na, your request could be traveling to computers across the globe. We don't actually know that it's across the globe because it all depends upon where www.gov.na is hosted. However, if you think about how far your message travels and how quickly the response shows up on your computer, it really boggles the mind. Super fast. Let's talk about domain names a little more. The domain name is the more common and user-friendly way of describing the website or location you are looking for. Examples are coke.com, csupomona.edu, whitehouse.gov, or twit.tv. Anyone can purchase a domain name if it isn't already taken. Try going to godaddy.com and typing in your name, .com, to see if it's available. When I checked, the domain names were $9 a year. You can find them cheaper than that. You can purchase hosting services from these sites, too. There are many companies that will sell you a domain name and hosting services for very, very cheap. While putting this lecture together, I just happened to check ruthguthrie.com again. It was owned by someone else. Today it was for sale, so I got an early birthday present for myself. You should go ahead and check your own name, because it would be pretty cool to own your own .com with your name. IP addresses. So that IP address, how does that work? The DNS translates the address sent by the user into an IP address that can be forwarded over the internet. All IP addresses have four three-digit segments, like 123.123.123.123. Each three-digit length can be a number between 0 and 255. So if you go to http colon slash slash www.checkmyipaddress.org, it will tell you what the IP address is of the machine you are working on. This afternoon, my IP was 134711682321. Or, if you type the IP number, it will show you the site, just like the domain name would. Try typing 216.64.210.28 into the address bar of your browser. The Coke website will appear. If an IP address is permanently assigned, like Coke, it's called a static address. If the IP address is assigned when you make your internet connection, like me working on campus today, it's a dynamic address. I'm sure you've noticed, too, that there are a variety of extensions for domain names. The common ones that you probably already know are .com, commercial, .edu, educational, .gov, government, .mil, military, .net, for internet companies, or .org, for nonprofits. Many more were added later. Among these are .biz, for business, .info, for information, or .mobi, for mobile. Sometimes you may also see a country code. .tv is the country code for Tuvalu. Tuvalu is a country, but the domain name extension is very popular because, of course, TV, television. VeriSign actually is a company that handles all the domain names from Tuvalu, and the Tuvalu government gets 20%. .au is Australia. .bb is Barbados. 
.us is United States, though you usually don't see .us because we're the inventors of the internet. So I'd like you to think about then and now. Before 1992, there was no e-commerce, online business or online advertising. In fact, if you tried to do that type of advertising, people got very mad at you. People operated on dial-up modems and the connection speeds were very slow. You wouldn't have even dreamed of downloading a movie to your PC. In fact, many people only use the internet for entertainment only at night so that they wouldn't impair people's work during the day. It sounds absolutely crazy now. Today, everything you can think of is online. Advertising has permeated every aspect of our lives. Movies and music are distributed over the internet, not only to computers, but to cell phones and tablets, too. People bank online, book travel, and purchase things online without thinking twice about it. You've probably heard people use the expression Web 2.0. The graphic interface and connecting people all over the world is what is commonly thought of as Web 1.0. It enabled people to do business more quickly and have a broader reach than their own geographic area. Web 2.0 refers to the social web. This is the power of web technologies to help people communicate. Examples are Facebook, of course, YouTube, or Twitter. The power of being connected creates new products, uses, and opportunities. Web 3.0 represents the future. What will the web turn into? Many feel that Web 3.0 will be semantic web or natural language processing web. That is, things will be easier to find using more complex language and data will be more accessible. So you could ask, I need gas and some quick food to eat, and get a response telling you your best options for achieving this goal. It makes you think of Siri and how helpful or unhelpful she can be. Instead of Siri directing me to a web search, I could ask, I want to see an action movie and eat after the movie. Where can I go near here? And get a quick, relevant answer. Web 3.0 means that information retrieved from the web will be more targeted and useful. The last idea I'd like to bring up in this lecture is the idea of disruptive versus sustaining innovations. In 1997, Clayton Christensen wrote The Innovator's Dilemma. He wrote about disruptive and sustaining technologies. A sustaining technology provides for incremental improvements to what is already being done by making them better, faster, cheaper, etc. A disruptive technology is one that fundamentally changes the way things are done. Disruptive technologies tend to be crude and unproven before they are adopted. They typically have only a small audience before they really catch on. Here are a few examples. A car is a disruptive technology. Once it got cheap enough, it eliminated the horse and carriage as a means of transportation. Downloading media is disruptive. Things like VHS tapes and DVDs are a thing of the past. Clearly, the web is a disruptive innovation. It has drastically changed many things we used to do. Under sustaining technologies, I put HDTV because it is a quality improvement over traditional TV, but it hasn't really changed business. We still purchase TVs and consume shows and movies in the same way. CRM I also listed as a sustaining technology. It is faster and better managed because of the introduction of a computing system, but the activities are still very similar to what was done in the past. Hybrid cars, too, have improved mileage and are better for the environment. However, improved features didn't create a new industry. The same technology and infrastructure is still in use. Quiz time! What is the protocol for the internet? TCPIP. What two people are considered the fathers of the internet? Vinton Cerf and Tim Berners-Lee. Describe the three evolutionary phases of the web, 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. 1.0 is connectedness for communicating and buying things and getting information. 2.0 is the social internet where people's communication can add value or create new products. Web 3.0 is semantic or natural language web. It still needs a lot of work. That's the end.